It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kapoor from Tufts. He's been a thought leader in, in this field, and we're looking forward to him sharing his insights into the uh, molecular underpinnings of um, unloading. Great, thanks everybody, and uh, if I could get my slides up, terrific. So I'm gonna be talking about the insights into the uh, molecular basis of acute cardiac unloading and cardiac protection and integrating some of uh, Dan's comments into uh, the work we've been doing. So I think if you think about what's been going on over the past decade, there's been uh, a lot of engineering, uh, and this engineering has been basically uh, used clinically to drive hope for many of the hopeless patients uh, that previously had no option. But when we look at the various strategies that have been employed in terms of mechanical devices for unloading, you can see on the left in 2007 with the introduction of the uh, change from pulsatile to continuous flow devices, these devices, the ultimate objective is to do cardiac replacement. Uh, these are bridge to transplant mechanisms or destination mechanisms. Uh, but recovery is not really in the, uh, in the terminologies used for those, uh, those ultimate uh, durable devices. And on the right side, as you can see in the past few years, what we've seen is an accelerating growth in the use of percutaneous technologies, uh, starting with the Impella CP, the 5.0 device, and now the Bipella configuration. And the goal, at least from a clinician's perspective, with all of those patients is cardiac recovery. It's not replacement. We want patients to uh, exist with their own native heart and recover to a point where they can leave the hospital without uh, a cardiotomy. And along those lines, I think this was what really drove the launch of the ACARE movement. Uh, this is really, truly a bench to bedside and back and forth, and that's really the exciting part of the science uh, and the ability to ask the right questions and then try to answer them as a team and then get back into the clinic to come up with more questions. Uh, the ACURE movement, of course, began uh, early on in Boston uh, about just a couple years ago. And going from Boston to meetings in Paris next last year in Rome and then this year in Barcelona, we've seen a major shift in uh, the amount of science coming out from preclinical testing uh, to fundamental discoveries to our preclinical door to unload trial that we ran in the large animals and then to the clinical door to unload launch uh, with the first patient being enrolled uh, in 2017. But I think the questions still keep coming, and the ultimate question is, can we reduce the burden of ischemic heart failure after a heart attack? And I think that gets towards some of Dan's points about unloading and remodeling. And then what are the cardioprotective mechanisms underlying LV unloading? So we talked about this last year from the Jack uh, 2016 paper, identifying that infarct size is an important target of therapy. But also, I think it's important to recognize that it's not just about infarct size, it's about limiting heart failure. And those two are linked, but they're not necessarily the same thing. So you can reduce the infarct size, but if you still have hemodynamics that are consistent with heart failure, this drives mortality for patients in the acute MI setting, whether it's STEMI or non-STEMI. And this is data from the Swede Heart Study, which illustrated that point. So ab about two years ago, we published this concept of the primary unloading hypothesis, where First, unloading the left ventricle and delaying reperfusion activates a cardioprotective program that limits myocardial damage in acute MI. And as you can see in the scatter plots on the left, this is infarct uh, to area at risk uh, with the degree of reduction in mean wall stress, uh, showing a correlation between unloading versus reperfusion alone. And interestingly, in this study, we identified an early molecular signal release of the cytokine stromal-derived factor 1-alpha, which is known to be cardioprotective. And this correlated also with infarct size and led us down a pathway of developing a hypothesis where we believe that mechanical unloading, in addition to its physiologic properties of reducing oxygen demand and increasing uh, oxygen supply, also led to an increase in the SDF1 CXCR4 signaling pathway, which is uh, linked very closely to a number of mediators that are known to also to be cardioprotective, including AKT, ERK, and GSK3 beta which leads to a shift that's a myocardial protective phenotype. Over the last year or so, we've been testing the kinetics of primary unloading, and the major question has been how important is the delay to reperfusion? And in this slide, what you can see is we started testing the idea of delaying 15 minutes, delaying 30 minutes, delaying 60 minutes, and it was pretty clear that the idea of delaying reperfusion seemed to be a necessary component of the benefit of reducing infarct size with a mechanical unloading device. But why is that important? And that's where we started imputing some ideas of physiologic as well as biologic mechanisms. And one of the physiologic impacts that we've become very interested in is the idea of functional reperfusion, this idea that with the LAD still occluded that you could get enhanced collateral flow uh, through non-occluded vessels and this would lead to a reduction in the area at risk 
and that this may be driving, at least from a physiologic perspective, uh, the uh, benefit in terms of reducing infarct size. We've also been thinking a lot about hemodynamic versus metabolic unloading, and I think this has been an area that we've been able to finally test now that we have a tool to give us the uh, hemodynamic unloading component and now to understand the difference between simply reducing pressure and volume in the left ventricle, but now also getting towards what is this, how is this impacting metabolism, and can we use some combination therapies to achieve the ultimate unloading that Dan showed uh, in terms of full support as well as full unloading. So with the biologic mechanisms and looking at the kinetics, we also learned that the release of stromal-derived factor one alpha in the ventricular tissue seemed to be highest after that 30-minute delay. And the question is, why was this happening? And so when we started looking a little bit more closely at how SDF1 is regulated, this didn't seem to be a transcriptional uh, event. This seemed to be a post-translational effect uh, of unloading. And when we looked at SDF1 regulation, it turns out that SDF1 is ubiquitously expressed. It has a very short half-life because when the protein is expressed, it's actually rapidly degraded by a number of metalloproteases as well as uh, DPP4. And these proteases essentially get rid of SDF1 uh, with, uh, within a matter of minutes. Uh, and also, there's another pathway that's shown in the illustration of a receptor that really takes uh, SDF1 down a degradation pathway known as the CXCR7 pathway. So the question was, what are the effect of mechanical unloading on these proteases and the expression of CXCR7? And maybe if you shut down the proteases, you're now seeing higher concentrations of SDF1 in a rapid time sequence. And so that's illustrated here where we see, and there's a poster in the back that you'll be seeing at noon today, which goes into all the detail about illustrating the fact that primary unloading reduces activity of these proteases, and that seems to, um, those proteases are the ones that promote SDF1 degradation. So if you can get rid of them, you may be getting, getting higher concentrations of SDF1. And so the hypothesis that we're working on now is the fact that by getting rid of those degradation pathways, there's a higher concentration of SDF1 uh, in the myocardium, especially during an acute injury, and then this may be leading towards that protective uh, phenotype and signaling pathway. And this paper from Mark Penn, shown on the left, his illustration uh, back then indicated that with primary reperfusion, there's an uncoupling temporally between SDF1 and its beneficial receptor, CXCR4. And what we're suggesting is that with primer and loading, by having a higher concentration of SDF1 localized around the time period where CXCR4 is actually expressed, you can actually bring the ligand and the receptor uh, temporarily together and lead to uh, a better phen uh, phenotype of protection. So the next question for us was, does the acute cardioprotective effect of primary and loading have a durable effect in terms of reducing heart failure? And so this classic slide from JCI illustrates the difference between stabilization post-infarct versus remodeling and heart failure, and this also links to Dan's comments about uh, volumetric changes. But also when you have remodeling, a lot of that is driven by molecular mechanisms known as the fetal gene program and a number of other gene uh, regulatory programs that drive maladaptive versus adaptive remodeling. So the next step was a simple, overly ambitious uh, preclinical trial that we embarked on where we basically took animals and subjected them to either primary reperfusion or to our primary unloading protocol, followed the animals out for 30 days, followed by a repeat uh, cardiac MRI, uh, echocardiography, PV loop acquisition, as well as uh, molecular phenotyping. And what we've identified, which will be shown here in abstract form again at the uh, poster session, is that with primary unloading, we saw a significant reduction in LV scar 30 days after myocardial infarction. And this LV scar was quantified by LGE during CMR, as well as using anatomic path measurements, and the two correlated very tightly together. We also saw that there was a significant improvement in terms of stroke volume, cardiac output, uh, in the animals that received primary unloading. We did not see an early sign of a change in volume, but I think this may be related to the time point. We were 30 days as opposed to 90 days or six months post-infarct. We also identified that there's a shift in the gene program and that this uh, use of primary unloading seems to limit uh, the pathway towards maladaptive remodeling. And as you can see with uh, certain key targets such as circa, calcineurin, BNP, and collagen, these are all favorably altered by primary unloading. And importantly, when we think about heart uh, failure me metrics such as BNP, we saw that in the LV tissue in the non-infarct zone 30 days after uh, myocardial infarction, if you received primary reperfusion, you had higher expression of BNP, uh, whereas if you had primary unloading, this expression is back towards control levels. And this was also reflected in the circulating BNP levels as well. 
We also then went back to our SDF1 hypothesis and identified that with primary unloading, there was an increase in SDF1 in the circulation over a period of the first week, and that this also correlated with a, an increase in SDF1 concentrations in the myocardial tissue, and that this will correlated directly with uh, reduction in scar size. So our idea now is that we may be mechanically reprogramming myocardial responses to injury in acute MI, such that with primary unloading, we get a protective effect uh, using this uh, gene program uh, the ability to harness this gene program. And so I think that we've identified is that we now have a platform for further investigation. So what if you could take primary unloading, stabilize hemodynamics, and now do things that you were told you could never do before, such as administer IV beta blockade in the midst of an anterior STEMI in a patient who otherwise would become hypotensive uh, without mechanical support? What if you could give coronary vasodilators? What if you could give various cocktails uh, what if you could drive the inhibition of these proteases, or if you could do things such as neuromodulation, which Kenji Sunagawa is uh, going to show us again later today. So I think the idea of a platform for further investigation makes it very exciting. We've started to test those hypotheses, trying to get to Dan's ultimate point of unloading and maximal support. This is the combination of an impella with IV esmolol administered during an anterior MI. Without the IV esmolol, without the uh, impella, just giving IV esmolol, you can see that there's a profound hypotensive effect in the animal during STEMI. But with the impella on, you now see that nice uncoupling in panel D, where you get that support and you start to see the unloading. And in panel C on the pressure volume loop, you can see the difference with unloading without the addition of a beta blocker versus with the addition of a beta blocker, getting to full support, full unloading. So we've done a lot from going from bench to bedside. This quote I'll leave up in the slide deck, but basically was from the editorial from our 2015 paper predicting that mechanical preconditioning will not translate into a successful clinical strategy. So we have a lot of work to do. We've gone within one year from a preclinical randomized trial to now a clinical randomized trial, which you'll hear about also today from Dr. Mirage. And so with that, I just want to acknowledge the immense amount of teamwork that it takes to get this work done. Uh, and all the collaborators that we have, as well as the funding support from Abiumed, the NIH, um, and some of the other foundations supporting this type of breakthrough work. So thanks very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Maybe that was very nice. Um, so SDF1 goes up uh, during MI. Um, do you think increasing it above a certain level is necessary? Is that the, the idea? Because it already goes up uh, quite significantly in myocardial infarction. Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, there's a little bit of mixed data out there in terms of SDF uh, and its expression, temporal expression, of course. Uh, what we found in our control animals actually was that there was a, a mild increase in SDF1. We didn't see much enhancement in signaling. Uh, through the SDF1 pathway. We also saw that the CXCR4 receptor was not upregulated, and so that also played a role in terms of whether or not we're seeing coupling between ligand and receptor. Mm -hmm. What we also identified in our work, which we didn't get a chance to get into in the short time we had, was that CXCR4 is also significantly upregulated the expression uh, with primary unloading. And so the idea that you can now have the receptor and the ligand, uh, those expression levels increased within the infarct zone, I think is the key element that we're seeing. The other thing, too, is that if you look at the literature, you know, we've seen other reports indicating that there's a loss of SDF1 during that first week, especially. We know this from the, from the stem cell trials with Osiris Therapeutics and the timing of delivery of stem cells, trying to target the maximal peak of SDF1 uh, for optimal engraftment of stem cells. And I think that possibility that we now have the uh, possibility of raising SDF1 locally earlier on in the infarct phase uh, really lends itself towards trying to get to that benefit before we see the injurious effects of reperfusion injury. And I think that's been the area that we've been trying to splice out. Naveen, I think that's excellent uh, work uh, as usual. Um, in relation to the SDF1, and as you alluded, the first thing that comes to mind is stem cell and, and kind of a motility of the cells. Um, do we know the source of the um, SDF1 in the sense, is it in the myocytes or non-myocyte, non or do you have any signal in your data? Yeah, it's a great question, and so a critically important one. I think because of the way the experiments are designed, especially in the acute setting, these are fairly rapid, short time points. So what we're, our, our initial thought is that this is actual local SDF1. 
of course, there's always the possibility that there's you know more um, release of SDF1 from local factors. As, as I said, SDF1 is ubiquitously expressed. And so whether SDF1 is being brought into the infarct zone versus locally uh, concentrated, our guess right now is that it's locally concentrated. Now that may be very different in the chronic model, where over a period of weeks, we start to see that growth in SDF1 levels and the circulation. And I think that's where we may be starting to see some of this more effect coming from bone marrow-derived stem cells uh, and various, uh, various stem cell origins. So I think there are probably two different, two different origins that exist uh, and two different uh, ways they're being applied. One in the acute setting of active ischemia reperfusion injury, and the second in the chronic setting of chronic remodeling uh, and the downstream effects over a period of days to weeks.